Good afternoon and welcome to the San Mateo Arboretum Society's hybrid seminar, Perennial Plants for Dry Shade with Gene Fleet and Mike Crabe. The program will last approximately 60 to 90 minutes and be recorded. Questions about specific plants that they are showing will be answered at the time and general questions can be answered at the end of the program. For those viewing on Zoom, submit your questions by clicking on the chat box icon at the bottom of your screen. A few days after the presentation, you'll be emailed a link to the recording and an evaluation form. Before we start, a little information about what is happening at the Arboretum Society. Our nursery in San Mateo Central Park is open Saturdays and Sundays from noon to three. Uh, enter the North Gate and yeah, payment is by credit or debit card, Google and Apple Pay, no cash is accepted. The nursery is staffed by volunteers and may occasionally be closed. The Master Gardener Plant Clinic has returned and is scheduled for the same day and time as our seminars. Check our website, sanmateoarboretum.org or call 650-579-0536, extension two for updated information. While you're in Central Park, there's the Rose Garden, Hummingbird Butterfly Garden, and our new demonstration gardens. I guess they aren't new anymore, it's been there a while. All are maintained by the Arboretum Society volunteers. In addition, there is an art exhibit and exhibit open 10 to three most Saturdays and Sundays in the uh, pump house here. Our presenters today are Jean Fleet and a local landscaper extraordinaire and part of the leadership team at the Arboretum Society and the Peninsula Camellia Society. He keeps busy. Mike Crabe is a plant expert with the San Marcos Growers. I will now turn it over to Mike and Jean. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I, uh, I'm a sales rep and represent San Marcos Growers, and we have a fantastic website on the internet. If anybody is, you know, needs to look any particular plants up. And um, so I guess we'll get right into it. We have a couple Daphnes. Uh, this one's Daphne Odora marginata, which is it's basically variegated. And then this is one of the newer hybrids that uh, it's like, yeah, eternal fragrance. Um, this is called the winter Daphne. And this is kind of, um, I don't know that it has a common name, but it does bloom more often than the winter Daphne. And, it, and that is relative to the fact that I believe it, it's a hybrid. And so you get what's called hybrid vigor. It's like your bedding plants. One reason why your bedding plants bloom so much is they're hybrids between two species or and they're sterile hybrids. So that means they just keep flowering and flowering and flowering and they keep trying to set seed, but they can't. So I say that those kind of plants are sexually frustrated because they can't reproduce, but so they keep putting all their energy into making flowers. And so that's why this one blooms more uh, throughout the year, as opposed to the winter Daphne. They do need really good drainage um, and acidic soil um, and shade. Well, of course, we're talking about dry shade. Um, and so if you kill your first one, don't uh, get discouraged. Try, try again. If you, uh, one of my good friends in the nursery business says, you really don't know a plant, so you've killed it at least three times. I agree. One of the uh, other features about Daphne, a good time to prune it, uh, it's before the new growth really comes out. So when it's blooming, uh, you could make cuttings, bring them into the bathroom. It's a good place to put them or uh, by your bed and uh, have uh, sweet dreams. <laughs> They're also deer resistant. We have a deer issue. Uh, this is uh, one of the hybrid camellias, Island Sunset. Um, camellias are rather drought tolerant once they get established and um, they come in all different shapes and sizes. And uh, some of the newer ones that have come out are species camellias that are actually have fragrant flowers. And you know the typical ones 
that we know about are usually, you know, the japonicas and the sasanquas. Um, and the sasanquas are kind of more fall blooming, and then the japonicas are a little, you know, later. Um, but some of the, the species ones have incredibly fragrant flowers. And if you're really into camellias, look, go online and look at nuccios, camellias before they no longer exist. <laughs> right. um, but there's a lot of new um, hybrids that uh, they don't have the big bang that the japonicas do, but they make up for it in abundance of flowers and the fragrance is really nice too. Um, I used to work for Suncrest Nurseries for over 20 plus years. And so I, we I kind of collected some camellias. I, um, and there's one, uh, some of them, the 15 gallon stock plants were covered with flowers. The ground was covered with flowers and it didn't even look like they had lost any. They, mm -hmm. The blooms were so prolific. So they, they make up in numbers what they don't have in size. Hey boys, uh, somebody on the chat wants you to list the plants that you're talking about. Maybe we can do that in the post. Mm, Get a list of all the plants you talked about. Can we do that later? They're going to have to take notes as we go because yeah. there's we can't make a We've list. We've got a bunch of plants. Yeah, there's too many and plants to make a list. They'll know as we talk about them. Uh, as Mike was saying, there are a lot of different camellias. Uh, a misnomer or uh, is that they do require a lot of water. As most plants that are newly planted, they're going to need some water to uh, get established. But once they're established, uh, they do well uh, in a drought situation. Maybe some of you live in a house uh, that when you moved into the house, uh, there was a camellia probably 15 feet tall uh, with a trunk, uh, maybe, wow. Well, yeah, <laughs> uh, camellias outlive people. Uh, so uh, it, it, they do respond well to pruning. Uh, the Philolia estate, if some of you are familiar with that, uh, in Woodside, uh, the gardeners uh, were confronted with the dilemma of having some camellias underneath the canopy of uh, oaks and other shade trees. Uh, and so the flowers were reaching way up. So the garden staff truncated some of these uh, with trunks this big around, cut them to about four feet high, no foliage, no branches. Uh, and of course, the plant's going to either die or live. And to live, it needs to generate new growth so it can photosynthesize. So if some of you have old camellias, you don't have to give up on them. Uh, and they're really good at regenerating from the bare stems. Uh, you know, you could make most, well, a, a general rule of thumb is like even on rhododendrons, you do it a third at a time. So that you know you've got two thirds of the plant can still photosynthesize and you can cut back a third of it, but the camellias are really good at resprouting from bare branches. And I, I happen to be in a house that was built in the la last century in the twenties or the thirties, and I do have one of those huge uh -huh. camellias. <laughs> and a guy comes around and cuts it for cut foliage. This is a, a different kind of camellia, uh, not known for its flowers, Camellia sinensis. Uh, it's a tea camellia. It's referred to that way because uh, the new growth in uh, Japan, China, and India, the new growth as it comes out, is pinched off and dried. That's free tea. Uh, and then when it's fermented, uh, that becomes a uh, black tea. And the different kinds, like uh, oolong or uh, uh, various other kinds, Japan, uh, they uh, originate depending on where they're grown. And the tea camellia does have fragrant flowers. And yeah. they are a small flower and it is fragrant. And then Jean brought this other, this is another tea camellia. Uh, and he, is, he, uh, he assures me it's not a virus. <laughs> <laughs> he assures me it's not a virus. Um, camellias, uh, Japonica camellias particularly, will develop, and this isn't the Japonica. There's another uh, sinensis, a yes, tea camellia. But it will develop a branch that will be modeled like this. Wow. Uh, and it's uh, it's not uh, a disease. 
it's just part of what the plant does. Well, plant mutation. Right. That's how we get a lot of our new varieties of fruit trees and flowering shrub, shrubs and trees. Uh, you know, you're, somebody's got in the nursery industry or in their garden, they notice that there's something unusual or different about a branch on their tree, shrub, or whatever. And that's where some of our new plants come from. They're not necessarily all coming from breeders that are out there playing, playing God with the, the plants. The audience question. Yeah. When you prune camellias, you say you prune a third and leave two thirds. Well, that's if they're too big and you're trying to move, bring it down. So you prune all branches, or how, how do you prune them? Excuse me, if it's a, a camellia that is really big, really old, uh, then uh, there are various approaches to it. If it's just a, a bush that you have, unfortunately, most mobile gardeners know how to make balls, uh, mm -hmm. squares, or rectangles. Uh, and believe it or not, those camellias will survive, but uh, eventually they'll start dying off from the inside. So uh, a rule of thumb is to uh, thin it out so that there is lots of uh, space for circulation of air. Mm -hmm. Right, and the time to prune most camellias is uh, after they're done blooming. That's when their new growth comes. And there's a little trick with camellias. Um, they put on a, a set certain amount of new growth each year. And what happens is at the terminal, well, this isn't, well, we don't have, oh, we have another camellia. Maybe the other one, perhaps maybe a little bit. Yeah, you see this terminal bud here? Maybe in this area. Yeah. That's this coming year's growth. So the secret with mostly, well, with japonicas and sasanquas and, and well, most camellias, it doesn't seem, they seem to put, make a lot of buds, the tea camellia. But if I pinch that out, you see this, there's some scarring there. That's from the bud scales from last year. So this was last year's growth from, from here to that bud. If I take this out here, if I pinch this out like that, that will now encourage all these buds from these previous uh, bud scale scars to leaf out. So if you wanna make your camellia bushy, you take out the, the current year's growth. If you just wanna change the direction of the branch, then you just prune it anywhere you want. You know, like if you want this branch to go out this way, then you cut it off to that leaf. And then just that apical bud there will keep going. So, but if you want to make them bushier, take out the terminal growth and that'll make them bushier. If you're just trying to change the direction of the growth, prune it down to wherever you want it, whatever direction you want it to go. Um, this is this one of the new Encore and values. Um, I would no, hardly get a gum a... hole, uh, but this was right next to it. Yeah. So this is a an, an azalea. So the FA is that for? I don't know what that stands for. But it's got a Japanese cultivar name. Anyway, evergreen shrub pink late spring blooms. Again, just like the camellia, prune it after flowering. And um, uh, azaleas, I've never had very good luck with these. I grew up in San Francisco and what would happen was the, the strawberry root weevil or the vine weevil, it has, it's a, you know, those little, that beetle with a little trunk on it. It's got like a, it's a, they call it a weevil, but it's a beetle, but it has this nose like proboscis on it. Well, those beetles lay their eggs in the soil and the, when the eggs hatch, they make this grub and the grub eats the roots off of azaleas. 
It also eats the roots off of a lot of things in the saxifrage family or the hydrangea family. So if you have cucurus in your yard and all of a sudden you pull one up and it has no roots, but the top looks great, it's the root weevil. It's e eating all the roots off of it. And it's, it's an issue if you are growing, well, if you're near somewhere where they're growing strawberries in particular, but we weren't living near strawberries in San Francisco. Yeah. Right shade, so they will once they're established, though. Yeah, uh, if camellias, the same thing. Uh, azaleas and camellias are essentially shallow rooted plants. Their feeder roots go horizontally. Uh, and so once the plant is established, uh, it's fine. Particularly uh, if, you, if your growing area is in a warm climate then a mulch on top of that during the summertime uh, helps to conserve the moisture. But again, once it's established, uh, uh, the plant uh, can do fine. Gene, could you repeat the question for the Zoomers? Just repeat the question quickly, what you were answering. Azaleas need water. Uh, azaleas oh. are more drought tolerant than you. Are they as right. drought okay. tolerant? Thanks. Well, this poor plant has had an identity crisis. It used to be a ligularia. Now it's a farfugium, <laughs> Japonicum variety giganteum. Um, this is a, a, a beautiful perennial that gets, um, the leaves can be up to this big and they're kind of kidney bean, sh kidney shaped. So they're kind of got a, you know, the indentation of the kidney is where they're attached to the, attached to the, the stem. And these are rather juvenile leaves. The bigger leaves will actually get up like this. And then the, the edges are revolute. They're kind of turned under. And it's a, it's a very formal, beautiful looking, beautiful plant. And a lot, of, um, a lot of coffee table books I've seen about Mediterranean gardens in Europe, they have, there's a lot of these they're using right next to their stone walls in the, you know, on the edge of their olive orchard in the shade. Um, it is in the Asteraceae, so eventually it will get yellow DYC, damn yellow de composite daisy flowers. <laughs> There's way too many of those. That's why we say DYC. <laughs> um, and they come in different styles. There are some ones that have uh, white spots. Right. It looks like somebody spilled bleach on the leaves. Um, there's other ones with uh, called the leopard, which well, has a yellow spot, too, yeah. and then there's a variegated one that has a cream variegation. Uh, we have one at the nursery in a concrete tub, about this big tub. The tub's about this big, and the plant coming out of the tub is like that. So I mean, it gets big, but you can you know divide it up and take cuttings and root them. Um, here we have a heart's tongue fern. Asplenium scolopendrium, heart's tongue fern. Yeah, um, a lot of your like kind of, you know, you look at the leaves on this thing, it's pretty leathery. So a lot of your more leathery leaves or fern leaves um, are pretty, are relatively drought tolerant. Um, and even in California, we have some native maidenhair ferns and they're drought tolerant and they're also hardy to cold. Too. There's actually a, uh, it, it looks just like the one you, you buy as a house plant, the maidenhair fern you buy as a house plant, but those are tropical or subtropical varieties of, of the maidenhair fern. The one you want is called the southern maidenhair, and that one is totally hardy. It actually even can take some morning sun um, and makes a, you know, who doesn't like maidenhair ferns? They're really beautiful with their black stems. But yeah, the, any of these kind of leathery leaf ones, there's also, this is a heart's tongue, there's a heart, a hare foot, the rabbit's foot. Those, um, the hare's foot is usually sometimes seen as a ground cover in the shade. And it has these orange, uh, orangey rusty colored hairs on the stolons that run along the top of the soil. And the rabbit's foot, most of the time you see that like in a hanging basket, people will put sphagnum moss and then they'll plant the fern and then the, the little the the stolons will cover the whole basket and then the fronds come out of, of that pretty pretty durable as, as mike was talking about 
making your proof. Uh, and from what he had said earlier, uh, you know, it you need to kill some if you uh, are going to develop some confidence, uh, unless you're just lucky and do well to start with. Uh, but it's easy with many different ferns to think that the plant is growth, but cut it back, especially maidenhair ferns, even the, the southern one that Mike was talking about. Uh, most any of these plants will have new growth, and when the uh, the new growth comes out, the old growth will start turning brown. Depending on the kind of fern, it may sporulate and look like it's diseased because yeah, it has- scale. So I don't know how many times when I worked in retail nurseries, what's wrong with my fern? It has scale on it. No, those are the sporangia. It's trying to reproduce and have spores. Um, the other thing I was going to say too, there are drought tolerant ferns. Um, they're not readily available, but uh, the UC Berkeley Botanic Garden outside of one of their greenhouse, their, I think it's outside their cactus house. They have this raised concrete bed and it's full of drought tolerant ferns. They tend to be called, be lit, called lip ferns. They're in the Chilanthes genus or there's the Pelea. Um, the common palea that you usually see is a house plant called the Korean rock fern, but you can grow that outside too. Again, it's they've got really tough leathery pinnae, the fronds are really leathery. Uh, the native paleas, we have a coffee fern and a bird's foot fern, mucronata, palea andromedifolia. Um, and then there's even some down into Mexico. I just noticed that Monterey Bay, I bought one from Monterey Bay that looks just like our coffee fern, except it's a different species, but same, it's a palea. This is, these are the, is a one of, a example of the modern, one of the modern uh, hybrids of the hellebore. Um, these, um, historically they were hybrids called Helleborus ex orientalis. And unfortunately the flowers all hung down so you had to get down on your hands and knees to see the flowers. But these modern hybrids, what they've been doing, they've been taking other species of hellebores. There's like Lividus corsicus and Niger, the um, Christmas rose hellebore, and they've been crossing those. And because the Niger, the Christmas rose, has a more in-your-face flower, but it's white. Um, they've been crossing them with Lividus corsicus and some of these other species of hellebores to try and get some different colors and, and, and get the flowers up so you don't have to get on your hands and knees to see them. They've also, some of them have picked up uh, some of silver coloration in the leaves. So it's not just about the flowers anymore, it's about the foliage and the leaves. And and because, again, because they're hybrids, um, these probably aren't going to set seed. Right. And that's why they're blooming so much. They want to reproduce, but they can't. They're probably sterile. Um, hmm. Yeah, it. That's the only one. No, there's. Yeah, a couple well, others. it does have some stamens, and it looks like there's some stigma, but. Right. They probably aren't, you know, the 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 chromosome counts don't match, you know, and so a lot of times you can get these first generation crosses, but then they don't they can't cross with themselves, and and they can't outcross because the chromosome numbers have to have to when you get to yeah. One of the things. Yeah. That, oh. Oh, that, yeah. Well, what you see is pretty much what you get. You know, the the clump will get a little wider. Um, they're yeah. really hardy. Yeah, they, very hardy. They grow super well in cold regions. Terrible. Yeah, yeah. they bloom in the winter time. Yeah. Well, starting depends on the variety, but some will bloom, uh, you know, before Christmas, like the the, the Christmas rose Niger's around Christmas and then uh, most of the other ones are later. Right. And then even the Orientalis, they'll they bloom after these. So that it's helped also to extend the season. 
Yeah. Can you make take cuttings of beans or because they're no, it has root to divisions. Root divisions. It's a okay. perennial. Yeah. Um, what I've learned about the hellebore, uh, and one of our gardening plants, uh, I I didn't see it in the store to bring it. Uh, beautiful speckled flowers. Some of them are double, and uh, it does well uh, because it's going to put out new growth after the flowers are finished. For the main part of the flowering, uh, these will lighten up. They won't be as exciting. Uh, Some of them turn green. Yeah. And, but uh, then the new growth is going to come out. Yeah. So in the autumn, before the or just as the flower spikes are coming up, whenever that is, you could cut off all of the, of the old growth <laughs> and it will bloom and the new growth will follow after that. Then there's no competition. You see only the flowers. And, and if, if the flower, if the foliage is all tattered and you know kind of weathered, um, yeah, there are double ones. But I, I like more what Mother Nature does. You know, double is not double flowers aren't always an improvement, <laughs> especially That's double. Also, double <laughs> double columbines. Uh, um. These are, this is a corridalis from China, and a, there's a whole different, uh, it's the species is flexuosa, cor corridalis or corridalis flexuosa. They come in, there's different cultivars. Um, the first one that came out was Pierre David, and then there was Blue Panda, and this one's called Porcelain Blue. Um, but they, this one tend, seems to have thinner foliage than the, the, the older or more the older uh, varieties. Um, as long as it's cool, they uh, tend to keep blooming. So it's a cool season perennial. And of course, if I had a nursery full of blue flowers, I could you know, retire easily. Right. Um, most, of the, most of the retail nursery clientele really love cobalt blue flowers. Like her jacket back there. If we had a whole had a whole nursery full of cobalt blue flowers, we could retire. <laughs> it seems to be everyone's favorite color. So, my experience of the blue ones is that they're not quite as hardy as the yellow flowered varieties. Well, those are weeds. <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> that's a matter of opinion. <laughs> right. Uh, I've been to a number of gardens in England and almost always the yellow uh, corridalis. And for the longest time, I pronounce it corridalis because that's what it looks like. Uh, but then I learned in England corridalis. So, <laughs> apricot, apricot, clematis, clematis, right. tomato, right. tomato. As long it, as we're communicating, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> right. That's the important part. Latin is a dead language, and there's church Latin and scientific Latin, and they can't even agree on how to pronounce things. So I don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> you didn't grow it. No. Um, yeah, everybody knows flowering maples or butylons. These are... Um, Great flowering plants, shrubs, shrubs to small trees, large shrubs to small, well, small shrubs to large shrubs. Um, they tend to be quite floriferous as long as you keep feeding them. Uh, and there, there's, um, there's been a lot of hybridization going on with them. Um, it's interesting at Suncrest, when I was at Suncrest Nurseries, um, Patrick Worley, who's known for his begonia and passiflora hybridizing was working on the abelias and what he was shooting for was a more open hibiscus like flower pointing up yeah that was yeah like the hellebores in your face because some of them are called so many of them are called lantern uh, flowering lantern because they hang down and look kind of like a lantern and then on the other extreme, you had Monterey Bay Nursery. They started hybridizing the butylons. And this is what they were shooting for. They were shooting for, it's hard to tell if it's their hybrid or not, but they were shooting for 
more smaller, more prolific flowering. And it's just interesting to, to what, difference. What I learned about uh, a beautiful one, I planted one from a 15 gallon can in my garden and it became, as Mike is saying, a tree with branches all over the place. Uh, but the flowers were only at the end of the new growth. So this winter, I whacked it way back. Uh, and I have seen uh, in different gardens where they have been cut back. Nice new growth comes during the season. Flowers that are right so that you can enjoy them. And this, this kind is, I use it sometimes as a container plant with other plants. Uh, just because of the coloration, they come in red, blue, white, um, sort of an orangey color. Uh, uh, Burgundy like, and yeah. yellows. And, and so you can play with it and treat it as an annual if you want to, uh, because they bloom so easily and at a young age. And just, yeah, just they like, they're fairly heavy feeders to keep doing that. Does anybody know what this is called in England? Pig squeak. <laughs> and I'll show you why. <laughs> oh, here we go. Um, That's this, a good thing to remember, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Got you to laugh, didn't I? Right. <laughs> this is uh, Virginia crassifolium. It's one of the uh, uh, been around a long time, fast, old fashioned Virginia. Uh, it's got nice pink flowers. These are good in dry shade. This is one of the newer hybrids, and what they've done is they've um, tried to get darker flowers, and then also you see the red back to the foliage. Um, that's something that they've been focusing on. And then also there's some of these that, that in the winter with the winter cold, they, actually the whole leaf will turn, you know, like that color, that right. reddish, reddish mm -hmm. color. And, uh, and they're, you know, Virginias are virtually indestructible. <laughs> so if it drops water or water, then it will You could rot them. Repeat the question. If you gave them more water than they needed, yeah, you could rot them. Um, and then it's, I think it's also one of the plants that you could have the vine weevils eat the roots yeah. off. But, you know, these things are probably so tough, you could, if it ate all the roots, you could stick it in the ground and it would re root itself. In different soil. Yeah. Okay, this is, this is one of the uh, cast iron plants from Japan. This is an aspidistra. This is called ashy for this frosted tip to the to the leaf. Um, it's called a cast iron plant because these things are virtually indestructible. You can grow this as a house plant. You could grow it in in the shade. Um, Almost in the dark. Yeah, yeah. Pretty much, yeah. These are one of the shade per plants, perennial. The flowers aren't anything to scream about. They're down at soil level, so you have to get down on your hands and knees to see them. Um, but it will take extremely low light conditions. And they come in, the well, the Japanese have been horticulturists for thousands of years. So they've had a lot of, well, just look at how many Japanese maples there are. They've had a lot of time to, pick and choose uh, plants. And so there's, this is one of their um, signature plants. And then the other signature plant that's, that is also called, a, is good in a really deep dark shade is called a rode, rodea. And that's R-O-H-D-E-A. And those also come in different shapes and forms. And the Japanese actually have special tall skinny pots that they put them in and they have a place of honor in their homes. Um, they, yeah, um, like, and variegated plants. They're really crazy about variegated plants. Before we got into it, I don't know, 10 or 15, 20 years ago, variegation was all the rage. I don't know, maybe it's starting to come back again. 
plants are like fashion, you know, they, they, things come and go. But the aspidistra are really great for dry shade and they come in, there's, there's spe speckled ones and uh, variegated with stripes. Uh, there's just a lot of them out there. And easy to divide, not, yeah. that's how they multiply really. It's kind of like a, you know, you're familiar with mother-in-law's tongue, Sansevieria. It's kind of been a similar plant. Now this is a Mexican mock orange. Um, and a lot of people get, when they'll go into their retail nursery and they say, I want, a, I want a mock orange. Well, you have to be a little more specific because there's Philadelphus is a mock orange. Um, Choicea is a mock orange. And Pittosporum tobira is a mock right. orange. So all three of them, that's the that's why we're not trying to be sound intelligent by using scientific names. It's just every plant has one name, one scientific name or botanical name. And wherever you are in the world, if you use that name, we know what you're talking about. There's no confusion. Um, ex Except when uh, uh, the plant people have been paid money to come up with a different name for that same plant. And then they're uh, the Zausneria, uh, <laughs> right, and epilobia. No, what, what has happened in that case, nobody gets paid any money. <laughs> the botanist or the taxonomist specifically, there are taxonomists, they're, they, you know, they, their world is about classification. They want to pigeonhole every plant. And within those, that group of people, there's lumpers and there's splitters. The lumpers want to make fewer groups and the splitters want to split hairs and make lots of different groups. And then to add to that confusion is nowadays, everything's done with DNA analysis. And so that's why you see so many name changes in the last five to 10 years is because as they learn more, it used to be taxonomy was based on the flower and the structures of the flower and the fruit, all those sexual characteristics. But now it's mostly about the DNA and the chromosomes. Mm -hmm. And so you end up that, um, you know, people know what plantain is, the weed in your garden. Guess what that's closely related to now? Penstemons. The plantain, you know, the big fat leaves lays on the ground and kind of a spike of flowers that are all congested. That's closely related to a penstemon based on uh, based on DNA. Yeah. You called it mock orange. Does it look like an orange tree? Is that what they call it? Or they they it? have a citrus like scent. What well, and the the flowers come in a cluster. Yeah. White and they smell a bit. Yeah, the Philadelphus can have kind of a, they, they're very fragrant. This is called a Mexican mock orange. This has a very fragrant flower, except it's very hard to buy these days because it's um, uh, the citrus disease that's going around, Billabong or something. This supposedly is a carrier of it. So they won't, um, I'm surprised to see this from Suncrest Nurseries. They must have had it for a while because they usually, you can't ship this across county lines anymore. And Suncrest is in Santa Cruz County and Half Moon Bay is in San Mateo County. Unfortunately, this is a great plant. My mom, I have a, my mom has a hedge of this in her garden. It's in the shade under a giant camellia. There used to be a giant Japanese black pine there. It ultimately died and we chopped, chopped it out. But it's, um, yeah, it's a beautiful, it's deer resistant, a great, um, a great hedge plant. Responds well to pruning. Yeah. And uh, there is a, Sort of a lime green chartreuse uh, uh, foliage, uh, or choicea also. Sun, really, Sundance, I think, is the cultivar. It's a nice uh, addition to the landscape because of its coloration. Yeah. Uh huh. So the and have in the shade, and they're not happy there. They want more sun. Yeah. Could you repeat the question? This is one that would be happier. Yeah, this yeah. could be Mock in, oranges in for a the lot shade. of sun, or it could be a, in a fair amount of shade also. The shade is a relative thing. I mean, you can have trees that are limbed up, 
And so you get a lot of light that comes in from the side, or you can have a lot of some of the oak trees, they have limbs all the way down, the foliage all the way down to the bottom of the ground, you know, down to the ground. So that's pretty deep, dark shade. So it, the shade is a relative concept. And then <laughs> that one is ch Choicea, C H O I S Y A, Ternata, T E R N A T A, Mexican mock orange. Then the regular, the, yeah, because, yeah, because it's so they're worried about it carrying the citrus disease. And since the citrus industry has a way more money than the nursery <laughs> industry, um, what they say goes. It's the same thing with the wine grape industry. That's why we have to have our stuff um, inspected for glassy wing sharpshooter because they're afraid that the glassy wing sharpshooter carries a virus that could get into the grapes and destroy the wine industry. And they have way more money than the ornamental nursery industry has. Um, this, I, while we're on the subject of chartreuse, um, I'm, I'm not a, uh, well, this is Theonosis griseus variety horizontalis diamond height, which happens to be the neighborhood I grew up in San Francisco. And I'm not really crazy about this plant being named after where I grew up. But Don't anyway, take it personally. <laughs> anyway, chartreuse is a great color for the shade. And a lot of chartreuse plants can't take full hot sun. So chartreuse plants, if you don't know what to do with this, you know, the funniest thing is when I started in this business for Suncrest, I sent some plants to the Sloat Garden Center at the zoo, and it was that golden form of the Mexican mock orange. They sent them back because they thought they were sick. <laughs> <laughs> so they didn't realize that that was the normal color. But anyway, chartreuse is a great color to use in the shade because it helps to brighten it up and lighten up the shade. And this is a ceanothus that typically ceanothus, California lilacs are a full sun, full hot sun plant, but this one will fry. So you need, it wants to be in some shade and makes a nice brown color. This is a Japanese anemone. Um, and Japanese anemones is a perennial and they, they, they spread by uh, in the ground by stoloniferous roots. Uh, they tend to be an autumn bloomer. They come in whites, pinks, and kind of um, a rose pink. And they can be singles or doubles. And they're just, a, it's a really tough plant. My, when I was growing up, my mom had a, a Japanese lady who was a seamstress who helped my grandmother and her sisters and my mom sew clothing. And her husband had a bonsai nursery and she encouraged my, well, I should backtrack a little bit. Guess what my nickname as, was as a kid? You know that bull? Ferdinand, yeah, that was my nickname. Ferdinand the bull, because rather than do my chores on Saturday, or, uh, I'd be out in the garden checking out all the flowers and whatnot. But anyway, Dorothy encouraged my horticultural interest and gave me a Japanese anemone. And it ultimately um, took over one whole hillside of our garden. Um, once we tore the junipers out, because we were, my parents' house is a mid-century house. so. Back in the mid-century, everyone had Tam junipers right. until my mom became allergic to Tam junipers. So then they all got taken out. Um, but they're tough plants, have beautiful flowers, and um, they sow seed too. Yeah, they most can of them. Yeah. So they multiply. Yes, you could divide them uh, by the root system, but you'll find them growing in different places in your garden just as a yeah. volunteer. And sometimes you'll see the hummingbirds will be collecting the, the fluff from the seed heads and they use it to, for their nests. This is another traditional Japanese plant, a kuba. Um, and like I said, this you could see this same markings on an aspidistra or a rodea, rodea that um, these a lot of times you find these you know out in the sunset district of san francisco you've got those houses that have the tunnel 
you walk in the tunnel and you go up the stairs to get to the front door. Well, traditionally you'd find an Akuba or a Rhodias or Aspidistra in those tunnels because they were so dark and dreary. And so you put something like this that has chartreuse or spotted speckled foliage to brighten it up. And these also, they come male and female. So they do have red berries. If you happen to have a male and a female so they can cross pollinate and you'll get beautiful red berries. Uh, the foliage can be typically spotted like this or all green. Uh, and of course the all green ones can really take uh, a, a deeper shade. Uh, also some of the, uh, the cubit will have lightning strikes in the leaves where there's a lot of variegation. Uh, the more variegation, as Mike was implying, uh, the uh, more shade that the plant will be happy with. This is, this is an old plant that's a pulmonaria, which in the medieval ages they called lungwort. Um, and in the medieval ages, you know, all, a lot of plants had medicinal value and everything was a lung wart or a kidney wart or a navel wart or this wart or that wart. <laughs> but the pulmonarias are, are lung warts. They tend to have larger, the foliage can be larger. It's usually speckled. This probably has smaller foliage because it's putting all its energy into flowers. The flowers can be white or they can be pink, blue, and then some of them are blue and kind of a lavender color. Um, these usually, if they don't get enough light, bright light, they can be mildew magnets. So it usually, you don't, you, um, they really need more sun. Uh, if it's too dark and shady, they become mildew magnets. But there, it's a, they, the foliage can, can be very beautiful. These are, we're kind of in vogue in the 90s, and then they kind of have disappeared. Who's doing this one? Monterey Bay. There's some art, some diehards. There's a guy up called Terra Nova Nursery, um, and he was responsible for the massive explosion of heucheras and the massive explosion of pulmonarias, lungworts, and uh, what other. Um, yeah, not Dan Hinckley, what's his name? Okay. Uh, he was just, yeah, he, it's like, yeah, he didn't, he wasn't very discriminating. He just kept throwing out more and more and more. This is Sarka Coca, which is called Sweet Shade. Um, it's, a, it comes in different shapes and sizes. There can be perennial forms of it that run or there's shrubby forms of it. In the courtyard outside the Striving Arboretum, the library, the, the library there at the Arboretum, they have a hedge of this. And a lot of times you you smell you walk in that courtyard and you you smell this wonderful fragrance and you're like looking around, where the hell is it coming from? It's from the sarcococa. It's a little tiny little hedge they have, but the flowers are these small white flowers. And so you don't really, they're kind of hidden among the foliage and you don't really notice them, but they have a really wonderful fragrance. And it's a, and it's smelling right now. It is, that's why it's here. <laughs> I started, yeah, it's overpowering. They're I, really, I have allergies, so I have very sensitive smell. They're really hardy. Yeah, very hardy. Nice, uh, they could be an individual plant or a hedge, or informal hedge. I'm, yeah, and they don't have to. There's it. been a lot of like, more perennial forms that have come out of China and Asia recently. Since, since China opened up back up again, um, what, 10 years ago? They're seeing a lot more uh, Chinese plants. Oh, I haven't seen one of these in forever. Brunnera, yeah, Macrophylla. These are related to the forget-me-not. So they have a little blue flower like a forget-me-not. Uh, unfortunately, most of your bang is in the foliage. What I like better are, um, they have a relative, Capodonica. 
oxymoides. It's, it's another perennial like this and it has similar foliage, but it blooms more. Um, the Brunneras tend to be kind of a one shot in the, one shot in the spring, um, but they are a fantastic, beautiful foliage plant. Uh, in the forget-me-not family. So those are more ground cover. Yeah, it's more, it's a perennial ground cover. And there are versions of this where the leaves, you know, they actually get a, you know, bigger than that. And really striking. So yeah. It's a nice uh, plant to have for shade uh, that has a different color foliage. Yeah, the it's foliage is, is mostly what you would grow it for. The flowers are incidental, but it's a beautiful foliage plant. Okay. Yeah, this is a chorus graminous ogon called licorice grass. Um, this is tough, is a tough grass-like plant for shade. Um, there's all, again, it's ogon is, is a common Japanese name for lots of plants. I don't recall, it might mean gold. I'm not, wouldn't swear to that, but there's a lot of plants Usually the ones that are yellow are called ogon because there's a spirea bridal wreath that's called ogon and it's pure golden foliage. Um, How have they developed the spread? Okay. No, it doesn't, it's not invasive. Okay. Yeah. Some of those grasses can be that. Yeah, it's it's a grass relative. It's not specifically a grass. Okay. It's more, it's a, you know, and it's, very cold hardy. There's green forms of this, there's short forms, there's tall forms. It comes in a lot of varieties. And then this is Ophiopogon. This is a black mondo grass. Um, there is a, there's a couple forms of this. This is kind of the traditional form. And being so black, it's very slow growing. But um, it's a beautiful, I mean, it's, this is a fantastic contract, you know, with the chartreuse. Um, and then it's part of my Halloween collection. <laughs> so for Halloween, when I worked at Suncrest, I always had a Halloween collection that was either orange flowers or black foliage or black flowers or orange foliage. And it was a specific, group of plants. Um, this is a heuchera. Um, the, the native heucheras and the hybrid of the native heucheras that tend to have the green leaves and the pink or white flowers tend to be more drought tolerant than these guys. Um, a lot of these are hybridized from some of the heucheras from back east and the ones from back east aren't as drought tolerant as ours. Like for instance, um, there's a, they're, they're also called alum roots, A-L-U-M-R-O-O-T. So there's a, a Heuchera maxima is the, what's the common name? Island Heuchera maybe? I don't know, it comes from the Channel Islands. Right. It's got big green leaves, um, tall flower stems with little white flowers, a coral, it's like they're coral belts. And what they did is they, there's a species in Arizona called Heuchera sanguinea. Sanguinea is usually means blood or, so anyway, that one has reddish, pinkish red or red flowers. So they cross the Heuchera maxima and the Heuchera sanguinea. And that's where we come up, came up with a lot of our green leaf uh, Heucheras that are more drought tolerant and have colored flowers. And some of them even have brown stems. And so that the flowers think I like dark stems because when the flat when they flower, the flowers seem like they're just hanging out there in midair because the black the dark stem just kind of disappears. Has anybody been to that nursery on um, where's Joe Lapara's? Oh, uh, well, green fashion now. Green fashion now. Anyway, he, they plant it. They they have a the whole place is surrounded by a chain link fence. He painted it black. It disappears. You don't see the fence. You see all the beautiful plants inside, but the fence like just disappears. So if you have a chain link fence and you want it to disappear, plant it black. <laughs> um, but anyway, I got off the subject here. The, 
yeah, the, so the flowers, they got um, their pinks and whites and dark pinks, light pinks and bite colors. Um, Windy is a cultivar that's pink. Rosada is another one that's pink and white. And then there's Old La Rochette, which has the brown stems and kind of white flowers. And then there's Opal. I, I wasn't a big fan of Opal because that ended up getting the rust, the Heuchera rust that they get. But so Old La Rochette is a similar color and that doesn't get the rust. Windy was, um, oh, uh, Santa Ana Cardinal. That's a very nice red, tall red flowered one. And then uh, Firefly is a short red. And then there's a Canyon series, which was done by Dara Emery at, uh, at the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden. And those are like smaller ones. Canyon Bell, Canyon, no, it's a Canyon series. And as Mike had said earlier, uh, if you find that some of your hookahs, especially if they've been in the garden for a while, uh, starting to look a little limp, and like you said, you take hold of it and there's no roots, it's that little um, a grub from the weevil that's munched on it. This is kind of the other group of um, Asian plants. You have, the, you have the liriopes, the turf lilies, which is the ophiopoke. Yeah, Ophiopogon, which is the black mondo grass. They also come in green. Mm -hmm. And there's different type, different species that have na small, narrow leaves to, you know, it comes in different shapes and sizes of the green variety of, of mondo grass is a common name for it. So there's black mondo grass and green mondo grass. Um, this is the turf lily, Liriope, or yeah, Liriope. I guess there's not really another way to say that. I, well, that's the way it is. Lirio. Liri that's you right. Say it yeah, that you way. could say it, Lirio. Um, spicata. This is called Silver Dragon. Um, it has this nice cream variegation. And, and what it'll do is at some part of it will be all green. It'll just sort of do that. Uh, there is an all green form of the Liriope. Other uh, Liriopes are vertical in its growth. Yeah rather than cascading like this. And they come in different colors. There's a white, Monroe white has white flowers. There's a Liriope gigantea that gets pretty big. Um, there's blue form, blue flowered forms, purple flowered forms. Uh, yeah, but you have some variegated plants, you have to keep an eye on them because sometimes they'll just start growing green foliage and that has, will take over the plant if you don't cut it out. Um, and that's kind of an issue with, um, how many people know what New Zealand flax are? Yeah, that's a problem with New Zealand flax. It's, they tend, some of them revert. They also have juvenile foliage versus mature foliage. Right. So you have the juvenile foliage will have one color and the mature foliage will have some other color. That's totally different from reversion. Reversion is where it just totally turns green or whatever. Um, Clivia, Clivia, yeah, the general manager at San Marcos Growers is always correcting me on how to say this because it's named after some aristocrat in England, the Duke or Earl of Clive. And like, I, you know, so some people say Clivia, some people say Clivia, again, whatever, whatever. You don't need to be a nitpicker. <laughs> Various color flowers. Yeah. Uh, white, a sort of a cream, more of a yellowish, uh, the orange. Uh, and Variegated foliage. Yeah. With orange flowers or yellow flowers. And uh, there are some of these available over in the nursery area. Um, Joe Salamone, who is a nurseryman in Santa Cruz, well, the Watsonville area of Santa Cruz County, he's responsible responsible for what's called the Solomony hybrids. And that's a yellow version of the Clivia, or Clivia. And um, they, uh, they're really beautiful. And then, but it's a separate company. You used to be able to get those through Monterey Bay Nursery, um, but uh, the partners have split up. And so the Clivias went with one partner and Monterey Bay Nurseries with the other partner. Uh, so, but they're starting up a new nursery called Internet, 
Los Arroyos International Nursery. And that's where a lot of the really nice clivias come from that are yellow and orange or variegated orange, variegated leaves with orange flowers or variegated with, um, yellow flowers. And he even has one that's like that, it's, uh, like this uh, aspidistra. The tips of the leaves are kind of have a, this kind of coloration. And I think, I don't know what he calls that. Cyclamen, these are, most people, these are really like a succulent. If you look at these leaves, they're very fleshy. And most people kill these with giving them too much water. So the secret is let them just, just start to wilt and then water them. Um, Cause most, like I said, most people kill them with kindness. They give them too much water. They really, they store a lot of water in these fleshy leaves. And as long as it's cool, they keep blooming. And um, I've actually had the miniature ones in little pots, which I kept in the shade. And I managed to keep them blooming almost year round because they were in a cool spot. And um, this is called the florist cyclamen. Um, there's a number of species of these that um, there's one that almost has like ivy like foliage, but most of them have this kind of silver markings on the foliage and the typical flower. And some of the, the species ones are, the flowers are actually fragrant also. And they're really tough. You know, you can put these, these will handle root competition. You can plant them at the base of trees um, and they'll go summer dormant and then they'll come back in the fall, winter. And like I said, the, some of the species ones um, have really beautiful foliage that looks like ivy and it's, hence it's called, Hedera is the name for ivy, it's hederafolia. So, you know, ivy foliage. Um, these, uh, if you plant them in one, as Mike was referring to them as a florist uh, cyclamen, <clears throat> these are the most commonly available at uh, nurseries, Home Depot, Lowe's, wherever. Uh, uh, during the winter time, uh, there are corn, uh, like a bulb. Yes. Uh, and round it, fat, about this thick. It, it, most uh, nurseries I've found uh, plant the corn deep. It really should have the top yeah. quarter part exposed. Like you plant a, a tuberous begonia. You want like half of it above ground and half, un, you know, underground because the roots, the roots will come from the base. As Mike was saying, uh, uh, some of the uh, the species uh, cyclamen. Uh, are uh, uh, they go dormant? Uh, Philoli has some in the woodland garden with corms that are easily a foot across. They've been there for years. Uh, they disappear uh, because you can't see them in the summertime. There they uh, die down, but the corm is there and they're uh, quick to come up uh, in the autumn, usually with the flowers coming first before the foliage comes. Then uh, the flowers will continue. And they tend to go to seeds, so they'll kind of pop around too. Um, and while we're on the subject of that, that it can handle root competition, there's a euphorbia um, amyloides variety rabii that also can take root competition. Uh, and then also this is a pelargonium called chocolate mint. If you rub this, it smells like chocolate mint. <laughs> Available over in the This nursery. is from the nursery over there, and I'll pass this around so you can smell it. Um, there's another one called Pelargonium tomentosum, and that's the mint, uh, yeah, peppermint pelargonium or peppermint geranium. Yeah, rub the brown part. That's where you get the full the smell from. And then the, the other one is called the peppermint pelargonium, and that's Pelargonium tomentosum. And it's got pretty big leaves and they're kind of fuzzy. Right. And that also, both of these will take root competition. Um, the most, you know, how many people have Monterey pine trees and they can't grow anything underneath them? Uh, in Los Osos in San Luis Obispo County is where I saw somebody had planted the Pelargonium tomentosum under the Monterey pines and they were happy. And the other thing too is you want to, if you're doing a ground cover under something like a pine tree or a conifer, they have a lot of litter. 
So you want a big leafed plant so that the litter can fall through. At Filoli, in the courtyard where the cafe is, they put in um, Arctostaphylus, ground cover Arctostaphylus under the oak trees in the courtyard. Well, the oak probably buried it. And so it croaked. So I, they asked me, what, do you, what should we use? And I said, well, get Mahonia repens. It's the creeping Oregon grape. And it's got you know, bigger leaves and it spreads by run, underground runners. And it gets beautiful yellow flowers and it gets little blue, you know, blueberries, like a typical Oregon grape, except it's a low ground cover. And then it gets beautiful fall color. And it's kind of a, it's not a shiny green like the typical Oregon grape, Mahonia aquifolium. Or now it's, you may see it called Berberis aquifolium. Again, those lumpers, they used to be Mahonia and the Mahonias and the Berberis. And the main difference was the Berberis didn't have spines and the Mahonias did, but now they're lumped together and now they're all Berberis. <laughs> the same thing with my Magnolias and Mycalias, they lumped those together. Magnolias tended to bloom on the ends of the branches. Mycalias bloom up and down. They lumped them all together. Um, so, so anyway, yeah. So the Mahonia repens makes a, is another good um, ground cover for where there's root competition. I brought this uh, bromeliad uh, partly because uh, bromeliads are pretty durable. This one's florist grown, so it has the uh, inflorescence right now. The actual flowers come uh, out of the stem at the where the juncture of the leaf is, uh, little white flowers usually. Uh, and when this is done blooming, eventually uh, the stem will die, then the, even the whole plant will die, but usually uh, pups have uh, developed before. Uh, they're durable and they can grow uh, in the shade area. And Lotus Land in Santa Barbara, under their oak tree, they have an oak, oak forest there, under the oak trees, they have um, bromeliads. And I'm sure lady of the house bought them to decorate the house. And then when they were done, she cut the inflorescence off. And these are the these are actually bracts, modified leaves. That and that's why they last so long. It's the like poinsettias. Poinsettias, those are bracts, the colored bracts. Poinsettia. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, she cut the tops off and put them out in the garden. And when you water these things, they really don't need much water from on the roots. You fill the cup the the uh, bromeliads have a cup and that's what you want to keep filled with water and maybe once a month you water the the base but there are other uh, and, bromeliads yeah. cryptanthus uh that have flat leaves yeah a uh, big that's little a huge group beautiful yeah. uh foliage uh yeah lots of them so they don't all have the cups like this that those they call earth stars the, uh, Palangians, uh, uh, some of these can also grow because they're uh, essentially epiphytic. They can grow up in trees. Which but they, they can... grow on other plants. Right. Epi is on. But they're epiphytic. not parasitical. They're not yeah. deriving their nutrients from uh, right. so That's when you brought. <laughs> um, these are... This is a lomandra. It's a grass-like plant from Australia. And the general manager at my, the nursery where I happen to be at the moment, he has a collection of these things. We're, we're mostly a landscape nursery. And so um, these, these came over from Australia and there's a whole bunch of them. But this is one of the variegated ones. It's called Platinum Beauty. It's part of the uh, Sunset Magazine series of plants, um, which for some reason they won't let us grow their plants, but Manuel Morales, the ex-partner of Monterey Bay Nursery, owns a propagation nursery called Gert Schneider, so he, he sells them to us. Prior to that, we used to buy gallon cans from Monterey Bay and shift them into bigger pots. Now that Manuel has his own propagation nursery, we can buy the liners from them, which are rose pots. They're you know two and a half inch square pot by three inches deep. 
that's a rose pot. Those are what liners are, go into. And liners are rooted cuttings or rooted or seedlings. And those go from a liner into a gallon uh, plant in nursery production. This is some um, Nandina domestica. It's called heavenly bamboo. This is a cultivar called um, Gulf Stream. There's a lot of different cultivars of, of this. Uh, it gets, they're great for dry shade. They're virtually indestructible. Uh, it's more, it's a heavenly bamboo. So it's kind of a clumping shrub, you know, bamboos don't let, don't get turned off by bamboos. This really isn't a bamboo, but it's just called heavenly bamboo because it kind of grows like a bamboo. But bamboos can be clumpers, walkers, or runners. <laughs> So what you want to stay away from are the runners. The clumpers and the walkers are perfectly well-behaved plants. And most of those are um, beautiful foliage plants and they want to be understory. They don't want to be in the full sun. A lot of them come from forests and they're growing underneath the canopy of the trees. Um, anyway, uh, Gulf Stream, you can see this is this winter color since we finally got a winter this year, it's actually turned red. And um, this is one of the smaller ones. It stays pretty low and tight, you know, probably uh, three, three plus or minus feet. Some of the ending is well. Yeah, yeah, there's six feet. Tall. Yeah, they come in a lot of shapes and sizes and um, like people. <laughs> No, this isn't a bamboo. It's called heavenly bamboo. See, that's the problem with common names. Ah, it's an Andina domestica. Yeah. Cultivar is Gulf Stream. Um, this is, yeah, it tends to be a, a low, tight one. And because of the cold weather, we finally got a winter. It's got this beautiful winter color. But these are, once these are established, um, they don't need any water. They, my parents have had Nandinas in their yard since the house was built in the 60s. And we don't water them once they got it were established. This is it. That's it? That's really? it. That's, I find fine. that hard to believe. It's time yeah. To well, it's time for it. Quarter uh, after two. Any, yeah, questions? Yeah. When you say you can slip the roots, I'm a huge slipper. I'm, I'm a neighbor. With so. an axe okay. or a shovel? <laughs> how, uh -huh. The question is, how do you split the roots? You just, you take a shovel, an axe, a machete. And you just cut it down the middle. Just whack it down the middle. Yeah. Or if you want to be gentle with it, you can take <laughs> it out of the pot and shake the soil off of it and te gently tease it apart. <laughs> But we're, you know, we're in this, we're in production, so we don't have time for that. <laughs> so it's machete, axe, <laughs> shovel. <laughs> yes. Um, I had a, I have a 30 year old camellia and my gardener cut straight across. Will it come back? How, are yeah, how much did he leave? He cut, I guess, about maybe three inches from the ground. Three inches from oh, the ground? Yeah. And I do see green. Yeah. Oh, well. Throw green. some fertilizer on it, all purpose. Mm -hmm. Throw some all purpose or acid fertilizer on it. Acid fertilizer would be better. What should I look for, though? I mean, green shoots coming out of that base. If you've got green shoots already, it, it's, it's not alive. Give up. Yeah. Yeah, it, well, if, yeah. if they're coming from the stump, yeah, they are. That's the camellia. Mm -hmm. There's nothing else coming from that stump. It was a, it's once a camellia, it's always a camellia. <laughs> yeah, they're really good. If you cut them back to stumps, that they'll come back. Yeah. Couple questions on the cat. Yeah. yeah. We spoke. Is it on? Where to buy camellias nearby? Uh, Trader Joe's. <laughs> <laughs> oh, where do you buy camellia? Bromelia. Oh, bromelia. Uh, house, there's a, sell house plant. <laughs> uh, there, there's a, a specialty nursery in Pacifica 
I'm forgetting right now what it's called, uh, but that's what they uh, specialize in is all sorts of uh, bromeliads. And Kalenzi is uh, uh, some of the bromeliads are uh, epiphytic, meaning they uh, they take the moisture from the air. Yeah. Some of them are terrestrial, meaning they have a root system that requires. These soil. guys are mass produced. Yeah. And they're gassed to change to make them bloom and change color. Or you can gas them with bananas. Um, ethylene, you know, from ripening bananas, ripening apples. You put them in a bag with the plant, and so in our garden, they're not going to. Well, they eventually will bloom. Yeah. Yeah. There's also a great fertilizer. If you have tillandsias, the air plants, there's a fertilizer called Epiphytes Delight. And it's, it's sold by Rainforest Flora, which is one of the major suppliers of tillandsias and air plants. And it's a powder. You mix it with water and you just dunk your tillandsias in there once a week. Or, and it's amazing. They... Well, basically the tillandsias, when they flower, they start pupping. Like, well, right. just like that one. If you, once that's done, the flower stem is done and that main plant dies, it will send up pups from the base. Well, the same thing with the tillandsias. They bloom and then that, that little crown dies, but then it pups. And as that goes on and on and on exponentially, you end up with a lot of these- ball. Tillandsias are like these balls of plants. And you can hang those up, you know, with wire and hang them in your trees. But this Epiphytes Delight works fantastic for them to grow well and also bloom well. And while I'm on that subject, um, African violet food works fantastic for cacti to get them to bloom. I don't remember the, some, I, I, when I was in retail in San Luis Obispo County, a guy would come up from San Diego in one of those little panel trucks, like a UPS truck, and his cactus were always blooming. And he said, what do you use? African violet food. I, and then I saw an epiphyllium guy, you know, the orchid cactus, or the, those big, huge orchid cactus with the big, long, flat pads, and they have these huge flowers. I asked him, what do you use? He gave me a ratio. Well, it ends up as the same ratio as African violet food. So remember, plants can't read fertilizer labels. They're, they're illiterate. <laughs> so it just, it's- They do communicate though. Yeah, well, if they're connected to the mycelium underground. Yeah, no, you just- <laughs> There can be- a, a, I have three a, fertilizers, all purpose, acid, and bloom. <laughs> it's all you really need. And it depends on what the plant is doing, what it's doing, what one it needs, or whether it's an acid loving. So I think plant. there's another question there. Are bromeliads frost hardy? No, most of them aren't. They're subtropical or tropical plants. But having said that, we usually grow them in the shade. So having overhead shade gives you at least 10 degrees of, of protection. Right. If that, you know, outside under the clear sky is 32, under the shade, it's hopefully about uh, 42. But typically they're not cold hardy or frost hardy. Anybody else? That's it. All right. Any other questions? Yes. So you mentioned the flowers that get the pups. Mm -hmm. um, how do you take the pups off? The bromeliads to get the pups? Yeah, start another one. What do you do? Just, you just pop on? Well, uh, you can, but you just leave it. Eventually, this whole center part just kind of shrivels up and. The mother plant, the just, center plant, like Mike is saying, will just die. You'll get dead leaves and you'll and you clean just, it up. And, yeah. But the pups will well, mature the, and they'll yeah. take over uh, just like kids in your house. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's what we mean by pupping. You get multiple babies. At least one, and sometimes yeah. two or three. If you wanted to pup, how would it be? Well, you'd have to wait till it got to a you know a good, size. good size and had its own semi root system on it, because they do have some kind of you know roots. On them. They're just they're not a really extensive root system. 
what they call roots are usually used to attach themselves to the host plant that they're growing on. You know, epi epiphytes are plants that grow on other plants. And so there's, there's ferns and bromeliads and orchids are all epiphytic plants. And there's even epiphytic cactus called ripsalias or the Christmas, Easter and Thanksgiving cactus. That's basically an epiphyte. And those will you know, live in the crotches of trees where debris builds up and then they'll, you know, they, but they don't really have some of their, some of them have, you know, a good fun functional root system and other ones, they don't really have a, like Tillandsia is basically those, what we would call roots are mostly just help them attach themselves to hang on. To hang on, yeah. You know, because a lot of times if you like, if you're in Mexico, you go into the oak pine forests up in the mountains and you look at these, well, not so much the pines, but you look at the oak trees, they're covered with plants. The branches are covered with plants. Not so much during the dry season because everything kind of shrivels up, but you go there in the wet season and there's ferns and orchids and bromeliads and mosses and selaginellas and, you know, all, there's a lot of things that are living in the trees and the ripsalias and the, the Christmas cactuses. There's actually cactus too. And there's even a philodendron relative that gets these big, huge leaves and they live up there too. Any other questions? No. Sue, right. are you chiming in? Oh, no. <laughs> thank All right, thank you very much. So, so it's terrific for presentation and a really great variety of plants. Thank you. And we so finished much. on time. We finished on time. Very good. Extra points Extra for that. Points. Yeah. Yeah. So, so in a few days, you'll be emailed a link to a recording of the presentation and the evaluation form. And we appreciate any feedback you can give us. And Really appreciate you filling that out. Um, if you have any unanswered questions, they can be addressed at that time. Please join us for future seminars and workshops on April 2nd. Our free seminar will be Spring and Summer Vegetable Gardening with Master Gardeners Lisa and Kathleen Putnam. They're terrific speakers if you've ever heard them speak before. We also have a free children's program on March Second, garden mobiles, uh, weather permitting, but you know, it looks like we're going to be having another, have a few dry days and then some more, some more rain coming up. We're also looking for energetic volunteers to help apply compost and mulch to the rose garden, and that is scheduled for next Saturday, the 11th. But looking at the forecast this morning. Looks like some more heavy rains coming in Friday and Saturday. So that will probably be postponed to the to the 18th. So uh, just go to our website, sanmateoarboretum.org and uh, get updated information. And again, a huge thank, thank you to Jean and Mike for that uh, terrific, you. terrific presentation. Yeah. I've got lots of ideas. <laughs> <laughs> and head over to the nursery to see yeah. what plants we have. Uh, what Sue did is uh, put stakes. Of course, uh, we run out of stakes to identify plants that we talked about here that are available over uh, in the nursery. And they're they're open till three today. So, and also thank you to Kevin, our Zoom technical specialist. Without him, we wouldn't right. be having these Zoom presentations. And it's interesting; we get a lot of people, you know, Good way to coming do it. on Zoom, and also you see the recording later. Uh, the Arboretum Society also has uh, lots of volunteer opportunities and uh, for the Greenhouse you, Education you. Committee. And uh, you can let us know on your evaluation forms or by emailing us at info at samateoarboretum.org. Thank you very much. And the program is now finished.